use of cannabis. And uh, Mark Richardson and Kelly Golab, they can also uh, attest to this in a moment. And so what we've done is we've, I've, I've adapted a very simple ritual from uh, the 19th century by this guy, Chandra Ananda uh, Kali. And he, in 1867, came up with uh, a, the three chillum ritual. It's dedicated to the three-phase Shiva. We've got a three-phase Shiva right here. Uh, I'm smoking a chillum, drinking this holy bong, and preparing bong right here, right? And uh, um, he would have been used, they would have been used in chillums much like this antique chillum from India. And uh, um, what, what, what uh, Ananda Chandra Kali's view was, uh, as he wanted to come up with a form of Shiva worship that uh, included all the different castes of, of India so that they weren't separated uh, um, through these racial divisions, you know, the, the color of their skin and th things like that. And so he came up with uh, the, the, the three, ch the three chums for the three phase Shiva and the three phase Shiva in his time was Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, which were the three main deities, which kind of broke up uh, uh, the caste system. But the three phase Shiva, he goes way back in history. That goes way back to the Kushan period when the Scythians uh, uh, were dominating Northern India. Uh, the three phase Shiva was worshiped as well then. So it, it, it's a very, very old God and very cannabis connected as well. And so uh, um, what we're going to do first is I'm going to um, invite everybody to like load a pipe or a chill. You know, the, the beauty of the three chill ritual is the simplicity of the ritual. That was the basis of it. Something that didn't take a lot of preparation, something that uh, everybody could partake of in together. And that's, that's kind of what we're going for here is something very simple and basic. And we're going to have a kind of an overview of Shiva in between the three chillings. We've got different speakers coming up throughout the next uh, couple of hours. And uh, we're gonna, then we're going to do a simple uh, um, um, bong pouring on the lingam ritual as well as at partway. And so let's start it all off by uh, loading up a chillum or a pipe or a joint. You can use whatever you want, but the idea is the three things. And uh, I'm going to let Marcus Gary Richardson, hey, why don't you pipe in? You know, you've been to India and you've been to the big celebration of the Kumbh Mela, uh, which is like the, 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 the huge, hugest celebration in the world. Longest continual, continual celebration, I believe, as well as probably the largest human gathering on earth. And uh, you've partaken of the Holy Ganja with sadhus, worshippers of Shiva right there in India. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, what an amazing experience it was to be able to uh, to be able to have that experience in the first place. And I, I kind of remember, you know, I think it was the year that Trey, you know, I was really into fish and I was traveling and cruising around and checking out fish. I kind of missed the Grateful Dead scene just by a little bit. Jerry passed away in 95. I ended up on this fish road. And around 1998, the guitarist from Fish was like, you know what, guys, like, I love that you're here every night. And in so many words, he basically said, go do something else. Like, honestly, stop following us around. Stop doing this. Go do something else. And I was like, you're right. I need to do something else. And I was like, what would be a cool, like, thing for me to go, like, travel like for tour like i'm going to see fish but it's not fish it's like a multi-thousand year old ancient ritual you know taken place by millions and millions of people over the course of our lifetimes and certainly even over the course of just my visit there was over three million people in the town that i went to so i did go to the kumba mela i was lucky enough to go for those of you that know a little bit about the kumba mela it is a festival that happens uh every three years in four different holy cities so i believe it's jaipur alabad uh, Varnasi and Haridwar. I could be wrong. I may have gotten that wrong. But I ended up in Haridwar where it redoes every 12 years, you end up for what is called the Maha Maha Kumbha Mela. Now they also have a, a Maha 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 Kumbha Mela, which is the 144 year cycle. So when you get into a rituals like this with a group of people that have had history like this, I mean, for me, it was the most incredible thing. And to compare it to fish and the Grateful Dead lot was very cool because when I got there and I was, you know, overwhelmed by all of these incredible people, you know, we started, you know, we started, oh, let's go smoke some charas with these guys. Let's go smoke. And we were smoking with all of these different sects, the Brahmas and the Vishnus and the, you know, the, the, the eventually the Shivites. But before I met the Shivites, I met the Nagas. 
And that was probably some of my most intense experience because that was, there was some massive cultural differences. I mean, I don't even think people in, like not everyone in India hangs out with the Nagas, you know, because there's even cultural differences in that culture. But for, for me, I found that it was just, they were just really the most out there from anything that I understood or knew. And I really thrived on hanging out with them. I mean, it was archaic hanging out with a bunch of kind of new dudes that were, you know, that we, they knew we didn't speak their language. So they were kind of grunting and using body languages. And we were just in these little, almost like cave-like huts and they've got their bodies covered in ashes and they don't own anything. And we're smoking this Nepali charis that, you know, me and my buddy brought to the Kumbh Mela. And it was just incredible. I remember leaving there. I remember leaving the Naga tent, if you will. And there was a Hare Krishna who was outside and he was quite educated. And, uh, you know, he looked, I, I could tell he'd been to like university, but he was also very, you know, he was following his, his spiritual path. But I was really kind of offended by what he said, because he said, Oh, what were you doing in there? And I said, Oh, we were just, you know, meeting and interacting and sharing energy. And he said, Did you eat any food? And I said, Yeah, of course, they offered us some food and we ate it. Oh, you will surely be poisoned. He said, he says to me, and I was just like, I was like, all right, so even here at the Kumbh Mela, there's this same petty energy that you find on fish tour, you know, like this is, this is something we're just recreating these rituals in our own rights through because we lack the culture in North America. So we recreate these gatherings. And I really found my people when I met Pashupati, the Shivite Baba that I connected with in Haridwar, the one that I continue to smoke with every day on the banks of the Ganges. One more chillum we are making. Yes, Baba Ji, one more chillum we are making. And man, did we smoke incredible hash. He had the nose. He found us like you, Chris, would find the dank on Dead Tour. You know, amongst 3 million people. And on a side note, this guy spoke over 50 languages. He would pull people off the Ganges. He'd just be like, that guy there, go, go get him, go get him. And then he would just speak their language. D didn't matter where they were from, North Korea, South Korea, Thailand, China, uh, Vietnam. He just spoke like, I didn't even know that one person could know that many languages. And in the meantime, his story was that he was caught stealing uh, as a young boy, nine years old, he had a choice to go to prison or to become the helper of the Babas. And so he started helping Babas and traveling with Babas. He, he was from uh, Rajasthan, so he ended up meeting some really colored, colorful character Shivite Babas, and they took him under their wing. And he would, you know, create and, and the, the clay cups in the morning so that they were all ready for the chai throughout the day. And he would keep the fire stoked and he would sweep the area on the banks of the river. And so doing that for many years, he, that's how he got onto the spiritual path of the Shivite Baba and uh, just really connected with the Shivites while I was in Haridwar. I never snubbed my nose at hanging out with anyone because I was so interested in learning from all these different cultures, but it took me two days to realize who my people were at the Mahakumbha Mela. He was the motorcycle Baba too. I think he was known as as well, wasn't he? That is a different Baba. That's, oh, that's Shiva. Shiva. That's Shiva Jiri. And Mark yeah. Rose can speak of Shiva Jiri later. And that was Doc Atomic who actually introduced Mark Rose to Shiva Jiri and sh I'm sure he has incredible stories because you know he that was a heavy baba that he was hanging out with and he hung out with him for a lot more than a month here and a month there he was he was invited into caves that like no white person has been invited into maybe ever you know like for sure at least for a thousand or two thousand years caves that cows were allowed in but uh, just not foreigners and so I, I hope he tells those stories later. Yeah, yeah, I wish I'd invited Dr. Atomic. I didn't really think of it. I, I, I actually, now that you mentioned it, I should have. He had taken, uh, when my son was born, he'd taken a picture to Shiva Jiri and uh, had, it, had it pictured. And you gave me the picture. So, uh, yeah, dude, I set that all up. We were, I was like, man, like, let's get a picture of. I actually asked Mark Rose to do that. And he was like, oh, I'm too afraid to ask Shiva Jiri. So then I asked Dr. Atomic and he was kind of like, oh man, like, I don't know. And I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? Like, of course, like this guy's full of love. Like just tell him the story. And, you know, two days later, there's, there's Shiva Jiri in the cave holding the picture of your son. Yeah. It was so incredible, dude. 
Yeah, incredible. And his son is called Shiva too. Yeah, by Shiva. Shiva. It was so cool. Trust me, I went out of my way to make that one happen. And so did Doc Atomic and so did Mark Rose. They were both just afraid to ask him. And I thought, well, come on, I get it that you revere and look up to this man. But, you know, listen, if he's emanating the love that you're saying he's emanating, then it's not going to be a question. He's going to say, of course. Mark Rose was surprised when he just said, of course. Yeah, give me the picture. Let's take it. You know, it's surprising, like these these guys would they're basically street people a lot of times, but then they're great figures of respect in India as well, you know, and, and with full of full of mojo as well. So it's like a real dichotomy. It was uh it was really hard for, for the British to understand when they first went in to India that these naked beggars were, were commanding the respect of the townspeople more so than they could with their weapons and horses and chariots and all that type of stuff. They must have missed those chapters in the Bible that said Jesus doesn't come back as a CEO of a Fortune 500 uh, company. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's generally going to be barefoot. He might look like a beggar. <laughs> what, you saying Trump isn't the new Messiah? <laughs> no comment. No comment. Well, uh, First speaker we got is here, Caligula Love, and he's going to give us, uh, you know, if you don't know about Shiva, now you know, because uh, our, our brother here is going to be giving us a, a good spiel on the background of Shiva in Kashmir. Well, thank you guys very much. I'm very grateful to be invited to talk. Um, I don't have to say what I'm about to say, but I want to say it because I have a lot of gratitude. And so traditionally, we thank our gurus, but because I normally break with tradition, I'm gonna do it anyway because out of gratitude, right? And so the first person I wanna thank is Chris because growing up, Chris was a major figure for me. Like I grew up uh, in Christianity and I broke away from Christianity, like my heart was broken and a major reunification with my, theolo my theology with Christianity was Chris's work. Chris kind of like gave me back the romance that I lost with Christianity because he, he made me realize that this plant and what Christ was saying and the, and the Jewish mysteries were this continuous message from ancient times that I eventually connected to Kashmir. Because in Kashmir, we have a mixing of the Jewish mysteries and the Shaivite mysteries. It, it was there where I found this big melting pot of ancient, ancient times where you could see the Jews and the Shaivites sharing Kabbalah and Shaivism side by side, mixing their theology. And so the modern Kabbalah and the modern Shaivism that we have today came from that mixing, came from that that intermixing of ideas from Shaivism. So everything Chris has been doing from the start has been leading up to this in the same way. And it's been like a confluence of rivers, just like the Yamuna, the Sarasvati and the Ganges meet at the at this, thr this triple point. Um, one of the main figures that connects all of our traditions is uh, it's called Triambakanatha, which is Dionysus. Dionysus is known as Triambos, the, the thrice great one, right? Uh, the winning one, the triumphant one. So Triambakanatha connects us to that river. Triambakanatha is also the, the God who is married to the triple rivers. The three over and over again, the triple, the triple rivers, the triple powers, the triple prongs, the triple goddesses. He's also the God who is married to the triple goddesses. So the, the special meaning of Triambakanatha also is not only three eyes, it's three rivers and three wives. It's three meanings in one. This idea that three meanings exist in one repeats itself over and over again. Even in like a Jewish Jewish text where you're supposed to interpret it, there's a, a threefold meaning in one. So in the same way, these Shaivite texts is three meanings in one. There's the Shambo interpretation, there's the Shakti interpretation, and there's the individual interpretation. We're dealing with the highest level in Kashmir, with the monistic, with the first one, the Shambo, with Shiva himself, where we identify directly and simply with Shiva. So when we talk about simplicity and bringing back simplicity, this particular time right now, Shiva Ratri is the union of the, of the future and of the past together, where the sun and the moon come together, where the in and out breath come together, where we realize now at this moment that everything's opening up and we get that understanding of the true potential of the future, where it was the same potential that came from the past. That Shiva is that, that consciousness of potentiality that has infinite evolution, infinite potentiality, Here's this moment now we're experiencing a radical revolution of consciousness. This psychedelic research has been like at the forefront of this. This is why I thank you and I consider you part of that lineage of gurus. I see you just as much as somebody that I honor as I, I do Swamiji. Thank you very much for your work. And in the same way, uh, Swami Lakshman Jew, he, 
opened up the tradition. In this age, he opened up tradition. So everybody gets initiation. Anybody can, can open up these texts. Anybody can listen to what we're saying and be initiated right now. The, the, everything has changed. The future is open to us. All of us are going to become Shiva if we want to, if we so desire. And it's that simple. In the 18th, uh, in ninth century, it was, it was one of the masters, uh, Utpala Deva. He is the master of the master of the master. He, he, he's one of the, the starting masters of this tradition. He opened this tradition up to everybody. He said, no, doesn't matter who you are, women, all castes, all creeds, all race, anybody. If you can understand these words, that's how simple it can be. It can be as simple as understanding because it is as simple as recognition. This is the school of recognition. It is the highest and the easiest path. And when we say easy, we, mean, we laugh because it's like, it's deceptively easy because it requires a level of mental fortitude that can only be facilitated by something like cannabis. So back again, cannabis is important because cannabis facilitates the forgetting of the world and the focusing on consciousness, on meditation, on the higher elevation of the mind. So cannabis, once again, brings us into the moment, into the focus, into the one-pointed awareness. So when Swamiji taught me how to pray, he was quoting the Gita. He was quoting a Vaishnava text, but he was like, it doesn't matter if it's a Vaishnava text. We will use the Vaishnava text and we'll say, you know, it, it's a chapter three of the Gita, verse 14, where he talks about rain, food, sacrifice. In the beginning, God created the world through sacrifice. We sacrifice to the Lord. The Lord rains blessings onto us. Well, whenever we light up, that same fire is the same fire of sacrifice. That fire in the joint is the yagnya. That same agni is the same agni in the in the Vedic fire rituals. We're performing the Vedic fire rituals when we light up and we say to ourselves, this is Shiva. This, the fire is Shiva. We are Shiva. I offer Shiva to Shiva who is Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva is consuming Lord Shiva. And you don't have to say it out loud. You can just recognize it as you're smoking your joint, as you're inhaling and exhaling. Both of these movements, it, it represents that, that constant throbbing, that constant awareness that Shiva is in everything, and, and that direct recognition is what, what I keep trying to bring up with this, uh, with this school. He's saying, Utpala Deva says, the direct constant recognition of the Lord is the highest form of devotion. No, nothing else is necessary. Just constantly remember that Lord Shiva is shining in everything all the time. And that becomes like this constant understanding that, that, that you do in everything. So you, our yoga is focused on going outside and working. Doing, help, helping the world. This missing piece of cashmere of Christ, cannabis, the Jewish mysteries, like this is a continuation of our heritage, my heritage, my, what I was raised in, what I've been researching, what you've been researching. Like this is a continuation of, of the, the dichotomy and what I feel is the, the resolution of the dichotomy of this world in which most of the world keeps fighting this fight where it seems like it's 
the scholars versus the warriors, right? But in ancient times, they were friends. And so like, why, it seems like, it's like we've degenerated into this fight between like um, the, the Jewish mysteries and the Aryan mysteries. But what if they were one in the same at one point, if they just all degenerated into the stupid fight? This ignorance of the Kali Yuga has made us forget that the, the scholars existed to facilitate the warriors. And then we have, we have to come together and realize that we're brothers and share in that unity, understand that we're specialized in different ways, but not restricted from the knowledge. See, I'm, I'm not trying to push caste. I'm just saying that we have to realize that the Vedas talk about how, well, what, what's good for you isn't good for me because I was built to do this and you were built to do that. So we shouldn't criticize each other. If you're in the mode of this, like, like you were talking about the Nagas, right? The Nagas are a completely different mentality, a different way of thinking, right? Well, the Kashmir Shaivism comes from Nagas. It comes from thinking. Swami Lakshman Jew, he doesn't identify with Rama. He identifies, he identifies with Lakshman. And Lakshman is considered um, a Naga. He's considered the, the reincarnation of Patanjali, who was a Naga. He's considered the, the incarnation of Sheshanaga. He's, in, he's uh, considered the, the direct incarnation of the Tamas Guna. So this whole Naga teaching is very dark. It's very sinister. It's intense. It's primal. It was here before humans was here. It was here when the reptiles were here. It is an extension of this primordial. And that's why in the midst, we always see um, the Naga and the human, Krishna and his brother Balarama, Rama and his Lakshman. You know, there's always the human teaching and the Naga teaching. And so here, here we are realized that Shiva is, is friends with the Nagas, friends with the Naga teachings. That's why Shiva is bold enough because he'll be friends with anybody. He'll be friends with the, with the, with the Nagas, with the ghosts, with the demons. And, and he's easy to, easy to please. Anybody can come offer anything to Shiva and he will give them boons. He will accept it. That's why we can come with not only cannabis, but any herb, any, any plant that we offer with love to Lord Shiva is a means and an access to Lord Shiva. That's why I love the word entheogen, because truly it is that theos, that Shiva that we're trying to generate, whether we do it through yoga or whether we do it through a preparation or an elixir or a plant, whether we do it through mantra or japa or kundalini awakening, like all are means to achieve Lord Shiva. My, my master, his favorite, his favorite uh, book was the Shiva Stotra Valley. It is a, a celebration, a song that was that was written when when uh, Utpalada was on the, on the on the boat and he was just singing it. He was just in ecstasy singing on the boat and his devotee was writing it down and he's just praising Lord Shiva, praising Lord Shiva. And he describes all of the sex. He, he describes the Kula sex, the Agora sex. He, he describes the right hand path, the left hand path, no hand path. He says that all paths are a mean to, to achieve Shiva, whether you want to do nothing or do everything, whether you, and he says the highest form of, of, of attainment is devotion. Devotion will carry you no matter what you do. If you put devotion in it, it will always carry you to the end. Devotion will carry you to all the yogic powers to, 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 to achievement of whatever it is that you want. Devotion to Lord Shiva in everything that you do is the means to attain whatever it is that you desire. And that's why it is so simple. Bolanath is always my favorite because he is so simple. I strive for that simplicity. That's why going forward, I want to make things as simple as possible for everybody. I feel that. I feel that. Let's, let's open everything up. Let's make it simple. It should be simple. That's the promise of technology, right? Like people take for granted clean power, clean energy, right? But that's something if you go to India, that's not something people have. That's something that, that, that's been as a huge leap. Sanitation, all these things. We should be as Shaivites coming back like the gods, introducing all this beauty, just in the same way they gave us beauty, we give beauty back to everybody. Why not? We have such beauty. What we have here is such a gift. Like you've literally discovered the Amrit. And now it's time to share it with everybody. Thank you, Chris, once again for your work. Thank you, Caligula. Brother, that was beautiful, man. And uh, yeah, there's, there's no escape from Shiva, man. We all return to Shiva. That, you know, all we can do is uh, struggle a little bit against it inevitably you know the big the in breath and out breath of the universe is the big bang and the return to the big bang and the the recycling and there's no escape man the best thing to do is just fall into sync with it man find your place in that cosmic scheme your will man and be one with shiva and our next uh friend uh, that's up speaking i see doug's there he made the technological leap and uh joined us on zoom 
And Doug as well, like uh, Marcus, has spent a lot of time in India, spent many years in India. And uh, I think he has some, uh, probably some stories to, to share with us, uh, Shiva related, Ganja related, uh, uh, whatever, whatever you can bring to the table. Brother Doug, it's all yours. Oh, you got to turn your, unmute your mic. There's a little spot there, see it, unmute. Yeah, it'll be on the bottom left. Bottom left. Am I on now? Yeah, we can. Okay. Uh, nice to see you again, Chris. Uh, I spent seven years in India. I originally went there because I, uh, I was in the pot business in the early 70s, and uh, everything became commercial. So I decided I'd go look for the hash fields. So I, had, I went to India. <laughs> and uh, when I was there, I met some incredible people and had some incredible experiences. I rode a motorcycle from one end of India to the other. And uh, I lived up in a place called uh, Kulu, uh, in Himachal Pradesh, mostly was my base, even though I was all over India. And in Himachal Pradesh, I lived in a valley called the Kulu Manali Valley, Parvati Valley. And it's very famous for quality hashish. And, and in one valley, Parvati Valley, who was the consort of Lord Shiva, in a little town called, a village actually called Manikaran, uh, is a home of Lord Shiva. And there's a mandir there as well as a gudwara. And uh, I lived in this area for years and years, and I, I became friends with this Naga Baba, who is a, the Naga Babas are priests of Lord Shiva. They wear, they don't have much, they only have a blanket and a lungi, and they have a fire, and they don't touch material things, money, or anything like that, you know. But this one Naga Baba was the most powerful man in a 500 mile radius. His name was Gopal Giri Maharaj, and uh, which is funny because he has a Vaishnava name, but he was a Naga Baba, a Shiva Baba. And he lived next to this little temple in, in a place called Aut, A-U-T, it's, it's spelled. And uh, he lived in a little shack beside the temple. And he was like, he was like the counselor, the Mary counselor, the, the, he, he was the doctor, the, he was the ruler. Even though he owned no possessions at all, he was the most powerful man. Everyone respected this man Matt, to the max, like the Pope or something. And uh, he lived next to this little Shiva temple, which I found really interesting because it had two altars. And the first altar was a Bhagwan. And Bhagwan is a yoni and lingam, or translated in English, a vagina with a penis in the center. And, and on Shiva Ratri, everybody bathes the lingam and the yoni with yogurt or, or, or uh, milk, uh, usually with a combination of cannabis, like a, a bang lassi kind of thing, and uh, flowers and garlands, and they have a feast. And, and it's the one day in India where cannabis is legal, being a sacrament. And the nice thing was this little temple next to him, the first altar was a Bhagwan. And then the second altar was a life-size deity of Lord Shiva and Parvati. And Lord Shiva is standing there and he has a meter long penis. And Parvati has her arms wrapped around the penis, smiling so sweet. <laughs> I used to love to take Christians there because they would, they, would, uh, they would go, oh, that's perverted. And I'd say, oh, but what's perverted? You, you worship a monkey on a stick. Come on, isn't that perverted? <laughs> just to make them realize that the different concept is not bad it's just different and it's a very sweet concept because the bhagwan goes back to the union of the male and female which begins life and and in india it's uh the oldest temples are bhagwan temples actually and uh but i used to love to take people there just to just to show them they make their minds see a different light, a different view, you know. Yeah. Also, this Nagababa and I, we got really lucky. I, uh, when I went to India, I went back and forth a few times. I lived in Boston at the time in, in the States. And uh, my doctor gave me a big bag of tetracycline 
eye cream and other medicines like uh, there was some penicillin also, right? And anyway, I, I took it with me to India. I didn't know, you know why I had it, all this medicine. But to show you that Shiva has a plan, <laughs> I, when I got to India, there was, I was living in this little village on the side of a mountain and uh, there was an eye flu. Then this eye flu took over all of India and it made people, they couldn't see, they couldn't function in the light for, for like two weeks, right? And this Nagababa and I, we went from village to village to village and we treated people with this tetracycline eye cream, which reduced the sickness to like two days. And we were so lucky to do this, to be able to help all these people. And I realized the doctor gave me this without knowing, but it, it's it, it, the God's plan. <laughs> and uh, as a result, I would wake up every morning in my little village I lived in and there would be potatoes and carrots and all these cauliflower, all these veggies on my doorstep. And this is the way the people repaid me. They're a very, very sweet place to live. It was around 3000 meters up in the Himalayas. And uh, it was a great experience. I, I have many, many stories, but I don't want to take up all your time. I thought just to share. One so story would be nice. To give that to them. Was Pardon? That just, was that just an intuition to give that to them, or like something told you that that would be a good medicine for them, or how did you come up with the idea? I, I didn't. I just wanted to take anything that was valuable back to India that I could take. I took seeds. I took grain. I took wheat. I took all different things with me, right? But the, because my doctor gave it to me, I thought, well, I'm going to the third world. Maybe this will come in handy. And it was, it was eye drops, tetracycline eye drops of all things. And when the Naga Baba, Baba told me this flu was taking over the villages, I was happy to go with him. And we went out all for the next few days, village to village to village, treating people with tetracycline eye cream and curing them of this horrible eye flu. You made some pretty good oil in India as well, didn't you? You blew a lot of uh, sadhus' minds with uh, the potent oil you were making. Yeah, I was actually turning hashish into honey oil using uh, petroleum ether as an extract and uh, activated charcoal to clean it up. And I had a, a, a great big leaching pot that held four kilos of hashish. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I was making oils and living very comfortably in India. And, and, and the Naga Baba, who was my friend, he loved my oil. He was <laughs> I was feeding him my oil. And and uh, he told the police not to, not to bother me, that if they did bother me, they would have to deal with him. And of course, everyone was very much, even the police, very much afraid of this man because he was the most powerful man and he had all the people behind him. So the police never ever bothered me. And I was sitting up in this village. It was illegal to make alcohol in this village, but I was sitting there making oil because oil is a sacrament. <laughs> well, almost like you were just protected. You had some kind of, yeah, you had some protection force and maybe that was, you know, Shiva protecting you to do your good work. Yeah. You know, a funny thing was when I was living there, uh, a bunch of people came down from Manali with a, like about 10 kilos of hashish and the police busted them. And my, and my Nagababa friend went into the police station. He took the hashish and says, this belongs to Shankar and walked out. <laughs> And the police couldn't touch him, of course. Right? <laughs> and then he gave it back to the, to the people that the police took it from. It was funny. There's a great book called uh, Cannabis Madness and Colonialism. And it's about <laughs> um, the trouble the British Raj faced with those type of individuals, the naked Babas and the naked Fakirs and the Islamic tradition. And uh, the British were, you know, going in there, taking over. This is like during the British Raj, but they would like be cruising down the streets in their, in their wagons and things like that. And uh, a naked Bob would walk right out in the middle of the street and stand in their way. And if they would try to get physical with them, it was a real line cross for the people. You can push people so much, but you start like messing with their religious world and they will rebel in a heartbeat, right? You know what I mean? So it was this tenuous situation where they were able to maintain control with a certain amount of respect. But if they crossed that line, then the people would uprise, you know? And so they oh. were trying to figure out what to do with these sadhus and stuff like that. 
And this is where this scientific explanation of, oh, well, cannabis, you know, it's a quasi-scientific explanation of uh, cannabis makes you mad uh, uh, first originated. And so they started saying, well, these guys are insane. And once they put a medical term <laughs> on it, it was less of an offense to the, the to the locals and stuff like that. And they just started grabbing up all these sad news and stuff all over the place. It's a, and it changed. It changed the Indian relationship with this holy herb. And it, the, the resonance of that British Raj prejudice against ganja is really still there now in bred into the people of India. And India should be leading the world in medical marijuana and in cannabis science. And they would be leading if it wasn't for that uh, earlier influence of the British Raj demonizing Shiva's holy plant. That's right. You're correct there. They demonized the plant. But the thing is, in India, the Naga Babas are very powerful and they had the backing of the people. So if the police don't have any control of Nagas because the people believe the Nagas are, are, are saintly people. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mark, I think your friend uh, Mark from Nepal is up next. Is he here or... Uh, I don't see him. Did you send him the link? Oh, I didn't. I guess I did. I, I didn't know him. I just thought you'd send him that. Maybe, <laughs> maybe he didn't know. I don't. I don't think he's on my friends list. He right? wasn't on the email. No, sorry, man. I should have mentioned that. I thought I'd mention that to you. Maybe I didn't. Well, I've got enough numbers. Uh, okay. I can send. Uh, does he know about it though? Like, yeah, I, I never mentioned anything to him. I, 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 he's, oh, I didn't see even if know we can pull him in. I wasn't really sure about that. I don't know if he's. I'll, uh, I'll just type for a few seconds. Let me. Yeah, no, for sure, man. We'll talk a little bit about the lingam, you know, um, you, you know, uh, uh, um, Doug mentioned the lingam there, and this is a classic example of the lingam uh, uh, inside the basin of, of the yoni, you know, and uh, um, <laughs> this is also, and this is the cobra. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, represented like Kundalini energy, which is like the power of sex instinct, you know, um, and this is a, uh, a three-faced Shiva, and it actually has over his uh, uh, phallus area an erect cobra serving as a lingam, you know. And uh, um, nice. I like this particular Shiva a lot because I just ended up with it in my shop. I don't even know where it came from. You know, when I have my shop, <coughs> I had a lot of uh, different things come through, but he's got like a chillum right here on his belt ready to go and then he's got the <laughs> right here you know erect and it, 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 with the, the the cobra and he's also the the three-faced shiva which goes with the the three-faced shiva chillum ritual uh, um but uh the lingam is like you know although it represents a phallus it's like the primal force the driving force of the universe you know and that's uh, uh um really like you know like just the, the the drive for life man you know like the, the 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 primal force of it all and um there's an interesting story in, in in the piranhas i think it is and you know one of the things i like about shiva is it's kind of almost like a folk tradition as well and you're not stuck with the dogmatic kind of uh, uh view of some of the other aspects, you know, the, some of the more like uh, exactly. fundamental aspects of Hinduism, you know what I mean? And so there's all sorts of folk tales and folk songs and, and then that, that type of stuff around Shiva. And I'm, uh, this is kind of an adaption of, of a Puranic myth as it was told to me. But uh, the story is that uh, Shiva was wandering through the jungle and uh, there was Brahmin women and they were at a, a pond washing their clothes and stuff like that. And Shiva comes out of the jungle naked, as he often, you know, generally was, with his erect phallus. And the women are like, oh, my God, what's this, you know? And uh, um, so they uh, uh, go running off to their husbands, Brahmins, and they, they say, oh, we were washing clothes, and this naked man showed up, a wild man with an erect phallus, you know? And they go, oh, this is terrible. Oh, my God, what the heck, you know? And they go down to where this guy, and they see him, and they call a curse down on him in the name of Brahma. And his phallus falls off. And it starts ripping through the forest, 
burning everything in his path and destroying. And they're like, what the heck, you know? And they go running to Brahma and they go, Brahma, Brahma. And they tell them the story of the, the, the their wives washing clothes and the naked jungle man with the erect phallus. And he goes, oh, no, that was Shiva, man. And that is the procreative force of the universe. He built a basin in the shape of a vagina and bathed it and worshiped it, you know? And this is like kind of true, I think in a lot of ways of the unbalanced phallic age that we're in, this patriarchal age that we're in and the unbalanced nature of, of, of the drive of the patriarchy, whether it being swords for piercing and penetrating or bullets or torpedoes or rockets for penetrating. It's all about dominating and penetrating other cultures. And uh, that is why this sacred herb energy, you know, the, 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 the yoni energy, which is present in cannabis. We grow ganja for its, its female qualities, you know? And this is what the symbolism of the pouring of the bong on the linga is about, is, is restoring that balance, is cooling it. Shiva was introduced to ganja by Parvate to calm him down, to stop his wanderings to chill them out when they were having a fight. You know, those are what the folk myths say about it. And so it's a really potent relationship, this, this relationship between ganja and, and the male god, because the ganja balances the male god with the female energy, you know? Yeah, you're very right there. In India, uh, Parvati, before she was Parvati, her name was Sati, and she was embarrassed by her father, Daksha, and Shiva tends to get very angry. And this is why Parvati introduced him to Ganja, because he got so angry, he chopped off Daksha's head, her father's head, because she burned herself up because she was so disrespected by her father, her father disrespecting Lord Shiva. So she burned her body up and took another body later as Parvati. But Shiva tend to get very angry and he replaced her father's head with a head of a goat <laughs> as he did with his own son, Ganesh. So yeah, Ganja was, is really the, it's the balance. It saved my life <laughs> and I think many, many more. Nice. I see another brother is here, Satchan Raja. Satchan, always a pleasure. Uh, another uh, pilgrim to, to his homeland, India, uh, um, uh, taken in a few Kumbh Melas as well. And, and we've invited Satchan to talk Mela. a little bit about his experience with the Chillam in India and Kumbh Mela and to, to share some of his wisdom with us. Welcome, Satchan. Thanks so much for having me, Christina, Chris, brothers, sisters in the world, Ganja lovers, Shiva lovers. We all unite tonight. Oh. You let me know when you're ready for me to pipe in. Go ahead, man. We're, we're, we're a little bit, uh, we had a, a missing speaker, so we'll, we'll get you in a bit early. And uh... Very good. My joy. Well, everyone, let's pull out the sacred plant, the sacred herb. Another round for those of you who have already gone through a few rounds. Om Shiva, Om Namah, Shivaya, Om Namah. May all beings know peace. May all beings know truth. May all beings know love. May all beings be sanctified in the ritual fire of truth and beingness. Oh, let's all smoke to the great one. So friends, family, lovers, so wonderful to be here. You know, I have Indian roots. I was born in uh, Uganda, Africa raised mostly in Canada, but I've been many times to India. And I had a wonderful sharing years back with Chris. Chris and I go back. I've been totally enthralled by his work, but more valuable is who he is as a being, as a person who cares about the illumination of society, not just his scholarly capacity, which is brilliant, but the root of where that comes from. And I believe that's the root of Shiva itself. Now, there's a term... We have all heard of in the Western world, Shiva, as portrayed as the destroyer. But I would like to give you another offering of the translation of the term Shiv. And that is not as the destroyer in the harsh sense, but a more accurate, artful, 
translation would be taking into account the sound, the energy, the language, is the kind, K-I-N-D, the kind dissolver. So first of all, if I can invite us to rescript our way of thinking, slash, burn, kill, destroy, and look at it as what within our personal existence and reality, what is within our personal existence and reality that we fear in this time of letting go? This is a huge time. The whole world on multiple dimensions is being rescripted, up-leveled, uh, corruption, craziness, ego, all these uh, factionings are all up. Yes, Beneath it, I also feel, and I invite us to feel, a profound unifying sacred energy that is allowing the impurities to rise to the top, the churning, the churning, to rise all the bullshit to the top, which we see, which Chris is a great advocate of sharing the bullshit on the planet, right? So, but underneath it, we must recognize that Shiva, this energy within us, is not an external God. This is the God within. And this is the aspect of the triune aspect of God. There's the arising from the void into consciousness, the Brahma, this creation. We're looking at each other moment to moment, being recreated moment to fucking moment from nothing. And our bodies are sticking together. We have some fucking continuity, which is unbelievable. If you look at it at some atomic level, how the hell do we even have continuity? That is Vishnu, the continuity of existence, matter, energy, time, and space is the Vishnu quality, the arising out of the void into existence, into temporal dimensionality is considered Brahma. Now, what is Vishnu or Shiv? Shiv represents that which in our being, which is returning back into the void, returning back to the source of creation. So the traditional yogic warrior approach in the Kumbha Mela, the yogis taught me, the Naga Babas taught me, says, don't be scared of Shiva. Don't be scared of dissolving. How can you be scared of the ultimate benevolent love on the planet? Love also shows up in a way which allows things to dissolve and return back into the primordial elements of being. So I ask you on a pragmatic level, not just esoteric, all of his friends watching, listening. What in our life is Shiva yanking us with right now? How is Shiva putting his trident in us, shaking us up, pinching us, pointing us? It's three points, the heart, the mind, and the belly, the soul, the sex. Those are the three tridents when Shiva is active, is poking the fuck out of us. What for? He's looking for us to look for where are we holding on to something that deserves to dissolve. Is it a business we're holding on to? Is it a relationship we're trying to resurrect, 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 but it's much better off to let go and let go into the kind dissolving? Is it um, uh, uh, um, an ambition that you've been working on and you know what? It's just going flat, flat, flat. You're putting so much energy into it, but you're not getting the return from the universe. That's Shiva saying, this is not your path. Many of us have chosen and are walking down paths that our parents have chosen. Our society has imprinted into us that we should walk, we should take. This is a sacred time, my friends, that I've experienced more than any other time in my life where the willingness, if we can find that willingness so what's the fear? What do I'm holding on? Is it my home, my location? You know, I know my brother Chris has gone through this of letting go of his home base for years and moving into a whole new dimension. But I'm sure there was Shiva involved. He had to face within himself all the attachments for years of a home base that means something brings you, brings you calm, confidence, brings you a sense of home. Where in ourselves are we fucking holding on to fear? What's the biggest thing that Shiva is saying? It's time for this to dissolve. Is it a bad habit? Is it a limited thought? I'm not good enough. I have no value in the world. Let Shiva burn it. Maybe you think you're too big. 
Oh, I need to be this and grandize myself, be this and this. We see this in the world. Shiva will burn that down anyways. Shiva comes for those who self-aggrandize and tears them down. And what is that? That is the force of the kind, the benevolent dissolving. It might not look like it in the moment, but it is. The other form, rather than self-aggrandizement, that Shiva comes to purify within our being, to return back to the void, is self-depreciation. Where are we holding ourselves small? Where are we holding ourselves less than who we are? Are you smarter than, are you smart in a way that needs to come out? Are you radiant and beautiful in a way that needs to be expressed? What needs to be expressed that fear is holding you back with? This to me is the heart of Shiva. So let's take a few deep breaths and I'd like you to feel into your being. I'd like to feel into your being what you know right now you need to let go of. That you haven't built up enough courage, confidence, time, contemplation. But in your soul, you know it's time. It's time to let go. It's time not to be ruled by the fear of smallness. What's the one thing you can let go of? When you have that, let that percolate. Feel the fear within. Feel the, what would it mean if you let go of that husband, that wife, that dog? that business, that, that uh, co-worker, that boss, that employee, that relationship. And then, rather than trying to do this on our own, through our own personal will, let's connect with the grand will of Shiva inside. Be in communion with that energy of the kind dissolving. And rather than valiant ourselves, become push ourselves into the relinquishment of the fear. How about if we just offer the fear to Shiva in a sacred flame, a sacred smoke? Breathing in the life force. Knowing that with the deepest inhalation, the drawing in of life, the drawing of Brahma, the sustaining of Vishnu. And now, in the exhalation, the sacred offering, even your fear Shiva will take. Even your attachment, Shiva wants and yearns to absolve from you. Will you give it to that great disorganizing power of existence? Will you offer it without holding back, being greedy with your limitations, holding your fucking smallness, my smallness, to ourselves, prompting ourselves up to be the valiant nerds that we think we are when we're really embodied gods, embodiments of consciousness? Where are we anything less than the embodiment of total consciousness, total love? Let's have a smoke. Let's smoke to that. Let's. Smoke the Shiva, come rock us with the greatest gentleness. Poke us with his divine trident. Take that which is already denaturing that we're holding on to, to keep its current form and allow the form to be given its rightful completion package and path. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. You see, beloveds, family, world family, I believe that we are all incarnations of Shiv and Shakti. Here we have these beautiful couple in front of us. The divine manifestation in their own unique form, never to be found again. You and this one, you and this one. And yet in our uniqueness, the union of what is already the exact same also resides. Undifferentiated consciousness. Consciousness that's not limited by the frames and the walls and the boxes we put around it. 
Let us be wider than all those frames right now, my friends. Let us manifest Shiva right here, right now, by becoming wider and wider and wider than our minds, wider than our bodies, expanding our presence beyond the room that we're in, filling the room beyond, filling the greater room of our town, our city, our province, our state, wherever we are, filling the wider room of the country we're in, filling the wider room of the planet we are in, filling the wider room of the great vast expanse, filling the widest room of the great infinite universe and universes, all lokas. And as we expand out into the infinity of being, we sit here with a beautiful smile, we inhale a smoke, and remember, in the midst of our humanness, the sacred already resides. In the midst of all the fucking calamities that can come at us, we look at death in the face and smile with joy. Come and get me, Shiva. Come and get me to the great one. Thank you so much, Sanjay. Always a pleasure, brother. You're a very special man. And you too, my uh, brother. thanks for coming here and, and, and sharing your wisdom. Blessings. Much love. Om Namah Shivaya. And uh, for viewers at home who have prepared their bong for the lingam ritual, uh, it's time to get your lingam. Uh, where's that brass lingam? Now, um, the pouring a bong on the lingam, you know, to uh, cure the heat, you know, put out the fire of the male energy that's burning so much on our planet these days it's a very very ancient ritual you know and one of the big reasons that uh the, the bong on the on the lingam ritual was for was for malaria in in um in india in the 19th century that was it was a big problem malaria and and one of the ways that they would would would, would try to uh, beg sheba to release it was by pouring bong on the lingam to put out the fire of that you know and we're kind of suffering under a fever these days in the world. You know, the COVID has been pretty brutal, man, for, for humanity. And it's surprising how interesting how much uh, medicinal cannabis has been affected for that for a lot of people. And the scientific studies going on around Shiva's plant in, in relation to COVID. Uh, um, there's all sorts of different angles that it's being looked at for COVID, you know, and it's probably good for malaria back in the day as well. But I think that, you know, on this Shiva Ratri, that we should really all say a prayer for Shiva to release humanity from the bonds of this cruel COVID, which has taken loved ones from some of us, which we've seen spread around the planet and change things, you know. Maybe it's given humanity a pause for reflection in a lot of ways, you know. Maybe it's Shiva's will that this has happened. But I think that it's time to move past this, you know, and I think that we can all join together in a prayer, pouring bong on the linga. Let's all focus and think of the suffering that this COVID has caused around the world. The half a million people dead, you know, in America alone, millions of people dead around the globe from this cruel, cruel disease unable to visit with our grandparents and our, and our older people in isolation in their last years because of the cruelness of this disease. Let's all ask Lord Shiva uh, um, to, to, to release us, release humanity from this fever and uh, pour some bong on the lingam. And uh, my Shakti is going to take the honors here and pour bong on this lingam. So I'm just gonna actually show what the bong looks like because people might not have seen it before. I'm just gonna show. Yeah, if you're joining it, you don't have no idea what's going on. Bong is a traditional drink prepared with cannabis in India. It's Shiva's favorite drink. And people have been preparing bong for, for thousands of years. The, the, the Vedic Soma may have been a drink very similar to bong. There's certainly evidence indicating that. And so this is Shiva's sacred drink since time immemorial, the way he sought relief. And we're gonna pour some bong on Shiva's lingam 
as people have done for centuries. Boom, boom, Mahadev. Boom, Bolanath. Releases from this fever. Well, we can kind of chit chat for a little while. Uh, um, Richard's not up for, for a few minutes yet. Did you ever get a hold of Mark Rose, Marcus? No, I sent him like three messages to three different numbers and Skype, you know, saying right. what happened and that what we're doing and that he's invited. But uh, I don't even know where he is in the world right now. Well, there you go. It's a whole other it's a whole other country over there in Nepal where he is. So we'll just think of him here and say a prayer for him. Uh, has anybody got anything they want to add in here or prayer or anything like that? I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what role Shakti plays in the Kashmir Shaiva tradition. And I just want to say as quickly as I can, because uh, there's a lot of information, but in reality, we're, we're actually Shakti worshipers. Um, we worship Sarasvati or Sharada Devi, which is one and the same. Sharada is the, the goddess of knowledge and of language. Sharada is actually the three main phenomes, the three mother phenomes put together, Sharada. So when we have Sharada, when we say we have faith Sharada, we actually have Sharada, which is possess knowledge. Knowledge gives us faith because when we have knowledge, we have certainty. And that certainty of will, that willpower is Shakti. So in our tradition, Shakti is willpower, but it is Lord Shiva's willpower to do whatever he wants. So in this way, we understand that there's no such thing as Maya. There's only the free will of Lord Shiva. Everything is Lord Shiva's free will all the time, including your free will. In fact, in chapter two of the Shiva Stotravali, it says, Lord Shiva's infinite power is found in every bit of Lord Shiva. So Shakti, which is Lord Shiva's power is so infinite that she can reproduce herself infinitely, even in the tiniest speck of Shakti can produce the most infinite potential of Shakti. So even the tiniest grain of sand has infinity in it, has Shakti infinite in it, right? Well, our own willpower is like that grain of sand that can expand into the grandness of Shakti herself. The, the Lord is so grand that each of us can become a Shiva himself. This is a secret teaching of Shaiva Siddhanta. This is, means that we become ontologically distinct Shaivas ourselves. I, you, me, all of us can become our own Shivas because Shiva is so grand that he can infinitely reproduce to infinite Shivas if you desire, if you will. And that willpower is Shakti. That willpower is Maya. They're one and the same. So this, this bondage is not bondage. It is willpower. When you realize that, is, that it's all your willpower, you're never going to be bound. It is infinitely your freedom to create anything, because, but you got to put that willpower into it. And that's that in our, in our tradition, Shiva is that virya. He is that fire that he puts into the Shakti, but then Shakti turns it into everything good. She is the sacred cow. If, if it is the proper worship of Shakti that produces all the beautiful things in this world. So it's like, we must learn how to turn that fire into love. I think that's why more than anything cannabis teaches us how to turn that virya into something beautiful that blossoms into something that's that's like a something that allows us to see beauty i i more than anything want us to understand that shakti is beauty and she shines in everything and she is power and she is so infinite that all of us have access to that infinity and that she is everywhere if we allow her to enter our life in every space beautiful man you know there's some one of the guys I really like that writes about Shiva is this guy, Elaine Danilo. And this book here is uh, Dionysius and Shiva about the connections uh, uh, between Shiva and Dionysius. And I'll maybe go into bit, that a bit later. And uh, um, here's another one of his books, Shiva and the Primordial Tradition. And uh, the, the, well, the gods play the Shiva oracles, which are all about Shiva in this time. Predictions about Shiva. 
in the Cali. His, his stuff is particularly different because he gives a different timeline. He says that he went along with actual yogis into the mountains to actual Naga yogis, right? And he writes that he talked to them about the real time cycles of the Kali Yuga. And he says, no, we're at the end of the Kali Yuga. This 43, this 400 year thousand stuff, that's just Vaishnava misinterpretation bullshit. The Shaivites have the real dates and we're at the end. And Swamiji says, the reason why we opened up the tradition is because we're at the end. We're at Pralia. We're at the fucking end right now. The world is fucking reciting. It's time to open, open everything up because people are going to need these teachings. This is like, this is literally the armor. This is like the, the lifesaver. We're, we got to come out and be like, hey guys, oh. this is simple. We can, we can give everybody what they need right now in the moment where they most desperately need it. Oh, you brother, you said something so fucking powerful. They just landed like, like everything for me. And that is, there is no Maya. That what was determined or, or called Maya in some ways of perception is actually the, the, the embodiment of the will of Shiva. This is our opportunity and this is Shakti expressing itself, not some illusion to overcome or to kill or destroy or to robe or to heal, you know? And that to me is the essence. It's so beautiful what you said and so needed now with a world where most religions, many uh, systems have an idea that, ah, oh, there's the illusion we must move beyond and transcend. And the problem is, is that we need to enter whatever the thing we want to move away from that we think is illusion and find the freaking truth of the willpower of who we are and how we are generating this. We are generating this. So I join you in recognizing this whole existence as the form of Shakti. You know, our next, our next is, speaker, let me just uh, introduce, yeah, we'll, we'll pick this up again. Our next speaker is impor an important speaker in this thing. You know, one of the things I mentioned about the three chillum ritual was that uh, uh, Chandra, Baba Chandra Kali there, he invented it to be inclusive, you know? And I think that's a really important, important message, you know? And Shiva represents everything between the two poles of the masculine and feminine, you know? Everything in between that, every, everybody. And a lot of religions in this Kali Yuga age have rejected people that stand between those two poles of the masculine and feminine. They persecuted them. They burnt them at the stake. They made them illegal. Shiva's always embraced them. It's always been part of Shiva energy. And our next speaker, Richard, they're going to talk to us about this dual aspect of Shiva. Richard. Right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. I really enjoyed the conversation so far. Um, so one thing to kind of disclose about myself is I identify as androgyne. I identify as both masculine and feminine myself and in my spiritual practice. Chris knows I'm a thelemite. I have a lot of involvement with OTO, the Gnostic Mass, and particularly the, the teachings of Aleister Crowley. And you know, I live in Baltimore and I work in Washington, DC. And um, I actually went to a, an exhibit on, uh, on Tantra and things like that over at the Smithsonian, they, they acknowledge Crowley's role in kind of bringing a lot of these ideas into Western culture in that time. You know, he's one of those figures who really made it more accessible and it, it really shows in a lot of his work and the things that I study. So um, I wanted to bring that up. The, the two um, things I wanted to talk about with my time today was, um, of course, Ardhana Rishvara, the, the androgyne aspect of Shiva and Parvati, the, the combined aspect of that. And another um, deity, you know, I'm, I'm honestly still learning a lot of, within the Hindu um, Hinduism, but uh, it came to my attention, um, Bahuchara Mata, who is the patroness of um, the, the Hidra, the, uh, the transgender community in India. And in fact, one of the like oldest extending cultural um, transgender cultures in the world. Um, so I don't know if I'm able to share my screen, but I wanted to bring up an image of that real quick, just for a con... Uh, Post disabled screen sharing. Ah, okay. So oh, I can't Mark, do that. Can you put the uh, screen sharing on for Richard? <laughs> it, uh, let me see if I can do it. Oh, there we go. Okay. Show your entire screen. Is it working? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I just got to hit it. Can you see my screen yet? I don't okay. see anything on it, just your name. Oh, weird. Okay. Um, I'll go into the settings. Oh, yeah, to see. I, got it, I got it. I see. There we go. Now, can you see my screen there? Yes. Is, 
Okay, so that's um, Bahuchara Mata, and she's the Hindu goddess of chastity, fertility, and her maiden aspect and of incarnation of the mother aspect of Shakti. And she's, as I mentioned, the, um, considered the patroness of the Hedra community. And I have some images of the Hedra. It's a really interesting. I, I just recently started to study about it. Um, so in the Indian subcontinent, uh, the Hedra are eunuchs, intersex people, and transgender people. Um, and the Hedra community in inter India prefer to call themselves Kinara Kinar, referring to the mythological beings that excel at song and dance. And um, one of the other things that's interesting about them culturally is that they're officially recognized as a third gender in India, um, being considered neither completely male or female. And they have a recorded history in the Indian subcontinent um, since antiquity, um, suggested by the Kama Sutra. So I bring them up as um, a contrast. These are some images of some of the, the Hedra um, community there, and these are some more images. Uh, I bring this up as a, uh, a contrast to what I'll talk about um, with the androgyne aspect as, uh, for comparison. So I was interested to learn about these two um, with Ardhana Rishvara. So I'll move over to the images um, of the androgyne next. And so these are some of the images of Shiva Parvati together in the Ardhana, Ardhana Rishvara form, um, where the male and female is split equally in half. And some of the other things that correspond in, in Western occultism, I have some images in here um, of, for instance, the devil card we were talking about. Uh, you were talking about the patriarchal phallic energy that kind of is permeating the world. And Shiva, in the masculine sense, is considered the, the ultimate uh, masculine entity. But in this androgyne form, it's an equally balanced masculine and feminine. So one of the other things you see in Western occultism, of course, the imagery of Baphomet, the androgyne um, of arcane perfection. So the breasts of the female, the phallus of the male, again, kind of um, bringing these contrasts in unison. And in alchemy, the alchemical rebus is um, symbolic of the magnum opus, the great work, the idea of blending the male and the female in one. And so I wanted to talk about um, what that means conceptually. So we talked about, um, let me see if I can stop sharing my screen for a minute. Um, the idea of becoming one with Shiva. And so, but who does Shiva become one with? Shiva becomes one with Parvati in that sense. And so like, how do we emulate that? How do we incorporate that masculine and feminine energy in ourselves? And you were talking about the influence it has on our world today, Chris, and also how Shiva is somebody who is a caretaker of those people. But those people are all people because every human being, whether you identify as male or female, have those components of that masculine feminine energy within them. And this, um, this, um, form of, of Shiva is Arhana Vishvara is uh, kind of uh, symbolizes that. And one of the things that's happening, um, you know, Alistair Crowley talked about the ages of the eons, the eon of Isis, the matriarchal age, the eon of Osiris, the patriarchal age, and what we're in now, what he would call the eon of Horus, the eon of the child. And the child was interesting. Isis is very obviously feminine matriarchal. Osiris was symbolic of um, very masculine patriarchal. And we're still we're still moving out of that age of, of Osiris. I mean, that, that kind of speaks to that masculine influence you were talking about and in, in, in some ways manifesting in intense toxic masculinity. And, and the solution to that isn't necessarily to erase masculinity or to, to get rid of it. It's actually to that blending and balancing with the feminine. And that's what Horace represents. And when Crowley wrote about Horace, he actually said um, the defining feature of the Eon of Horace is this idea of both sexes in one person. And a child is considered epicene. They're not fully, they haven't hit puberty. So they're not fully male or female. And that's this eon of the child and that kind of imagery. And I think a lot of that, I think Crowley was influenced by a lot of these ideas on what, what it means to blend the masculine and feminine and what that creates in a person's consciousness, their view of the universe and understanding of self and others. So I wanted to, um, there's a description of Ardhana Rishvara that I wanted to uh, read off real fast. It says, uh, talking about how the two Shiva Parvati combine each other. You understand he has to accommodate her in his own body. He has to shed half of himself. So he shed half of himself and included her. This is the story of Ardhana Shvara. This is basically trying to manifest that the masculine and the feminine are equally divided within yourself. And when he included her, he became ecstatic. What is being said is that the inner masculine and feminine meet, you are in a perpetual state of ecstasy. You do it to try to do it on the outside and it never lasts. And all troubles that come 
are that are an ongoing drama. Essentially, it is not two people longing to meet. It is two dimensions of life longing to meet outside as well as inside. If you achieve it inside, the outside will happen 100% by its choice. If you do not achieve it inside, the outside will be a terrible compulsion. This is the way of life. This is the reality which is being expressed in a beautiful dialectical form. Shiva included her as a part of himself and became half woman, half man. This is a symbolism to show that if you evolve in your ultimate context, you will be half a man and half a woman, not a neuter, a full-fledged man and a full-fledged woman. That is when you are a full-blown human being. You are not skewed development. You are not just masculine or feminine. You have allowed both these things to grow. Masculine and feminine does not mean male and female. The feminine and masculine are certain qualities. Only these two qualities happen in balance within. Can a human being live life of fulfillment? So I thought that was an interesting um, kind of perception of it. I'm going to move back to share my screen one more time for a few more images. I think I got a few minutes, right? Yep. A few Okay, let me see if I can share this again real fast, um, just to kind of talk about some of the theology and that kind of thing. So I, I pulled up a few charts um, that kind of talk about this idea of, so I can zoom in. Purusha and pra, uh, Prakruti. So, Purusha is the unmanifested, formless, passive, beyond attributes, beyond cause and effect, space and time. And so Purusha is, is, is Shiva, the pure existence. And Prakruti is um, Parvati, the, you know, his, his goddess that he combines with. Uh, Prakruti is the creative force of action, the source of form, manifestation, attributes and nature. And Mahat is the cosmic intelligence or booty. Um, Ahamkar is ego, the sense of I am, and then sattva, rajas, and tamas um, come into manifestation. And then tamas breaks down into the tapas of, um, you know, uh, earth, air, fire, water, and ether as well. And it's this idea that everything forms from the interaction of these two. And these two are symbolized by that androgyne concept of Shiva. But I think what's interesting is we are meant to incorporate that into ourselves. Um, it's kind of like a model, you know, like looking at that form and reflecting on it, meditating upon it, synchronizing yourself with it. How do you balance the masculine and feminine in yourself? What does that even mean to you? What is masculinity to you? What is femininity to you? How do these parts exist within you? And how do you temper yourself to balance them and, and radiate them and exude them and, and live them? So I wanted to also kind of draw your attention to something interesting uh, to me, at least. Um, the manifesto of, of Crowley's Gnostic Catholic Church, the whole point of the Gnostic Mass is, you know, I've had some history of politics over this because I used to be able to be a priestess in Gnostic Masses because when I read Crowley's works, I said, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. You know, I, I should be able to do any of these roles. And they put a bunch of really silly gender restrictions on it. They don't want me doing public Masses as a priestess, so of course I don't. But anyway, here's their manifesto that um, Crowley authorized in 1944 kind of relates to this idea of the, the ages and the masculine and feminine. So the world has entered March 1904, the new eon, the age of the crowned and conquering child, the predominance of the mother, eon of Isis, and the father, eon of Osiris, or of the past. Many people have not fully completed those formulae and they are still valid in their limited spheres, but the masters have decided that the time has come for the administration of the sacraments of the eon of Horus to those capable of comprehension. The sexes are equal and complementary. Every man and every woman is a star. The priestess must now function as well as the priest. The expression of the above thesis in public ritual is to begin by the establishment of the Gnostic mass, which while adhering to the vital elements of the most ancient and true tradition, fixes his attention on and aims most firmly in the future. And lastly, I just wanted to read a quick quote if I can find it. These are some things Crowley wrote in Magic Libra Abba Book 4. God is above sex and therefore neither man nor woman as such can be said fully to understand, much less represent God. It is therefore incumbent on the male magician to cultivate those female virtues, virtues in which he is deficient. And this task he must, of course, accomplish without in any way impairing his virility. It will then be lawful for a magician to invoke Isis and identify himself with her. If he failed to do this, his apprehension of the universe when he attains Samadhi will lack the conception of maternity. And last quote before I just talk a bit about um, discussion. This constitutes a profound riddle of holiness. This is a comment on um, one of the holy books of Thelema. Those only understand it who combine in themselves the extremes of moral idea, identifying them through transcendental overcoming of the antinomy. 
They must have gone further yet beyond the fundamental opposition of the sexes. The male must have completed himself and become androgyne, the female and become gynander. This incompleteness imprisons the soul. To think I am not woman but man or vice versa is to limit oneself, to set a bar to one's motion. It is the root of the shutting up which culminates in becoming a Mary and Violet or a black brother. So let me hop off my screen sharing. I just wanted to say, um, connecting this to the real world, what's happening in the real world around LGBTQ issues? Right now in the United States, there are tons of bills in the states right now um, on transgender athletes in high schools and things like that, saying we don't want transgender girls competing in sports. You know, um, we also, you know, it's not even that long ago that the United States legalized same-sex marriage, like 2015. It hasn't even been like, what, six years or something like that. But this progress is happening. And to me, that's kind of that current of the eon of Horus, that progress that's happening, that spirit that's guiding the evolution and the acceptance of people. And as we do that, I think in order to have that acceptance, where we're moving away from where we were historically, you were talking about people, it's true. Joan of Arc, why was she burned at the stake? Because she broke gender norms. You know what I mean? People, if you break a fucking gender norm, society's going to come get your ass. So for me, breaking the priestess uh, taboo over in, in Crowley's church, they came after me. I just got off bad report. You know what I mean? They, they, they were so pissed at me. Um, and why? Just because I said, no, I'm not going to. I said, you guys, this is how I understand my spirituality. I know that you some some people understand me over there, of course. But the people that write the rule book said, no, you know, we don't accept you. Sorry. Do what we say or get out. Um, I think that what we're seeing the eon of horror is that uh, the idea of the child and the and both sexes of one. It's incumbent on every person, kind of how Crowley would. It's incumbent on every man to invoke Isis, identify with her. We're talking. You can. We're talking about the same idea of balancing Shiva Parvati in that form that you can reflect on with that androgyne aspect. Um, how do we bring that into ourselves? Because that's sort of that 93 current to me. That that thelemic energy has a very androgynous, baphometic vibe. The Gnostic mass is numbered Libra 15. And tarot card 15 is the devil card. It's Baphomet, who Crowley called the androgyne, who is the hieroglyph of arcane perfection. So to me, I think it's incumbent on us to reflect upon what androgyny means, what the balance of the male-female forces mean, and, and what, what we can do with that power in our lives to help change the world. But anyway, um, I'll wrap up. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. Hopefully it was, uh, was interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Richard. You know, and it's interesting, you know, you talked about Crowley saying we had to bring into balance the masculine and the feminine to achieve samadhi. And what's interesting about that is, is the very first time that Aleister Crowley achieved samadhi, he was on hashish uh, in 1904. It was written in his diaries. This wasn't known until yeah. after his death when his diaries were, were revealed, because Crowley feared that people would reject his hmm. achievement of samadhi if they realized it came through drugs. This is hmm. a very special drug. It's a very special drug that's full of female energy. It's a very special drug that was recognized as the goddess, the tree of life in the ancient world. And it's here now to balance the out of control masculine energy. It's here now to pour the bong on the eternal lingam of us all, Jesus. all male energy, you know? And that's what's so needed. <laughs> sacrament as well. This is why this herb was so special to Crowley, you know? Well, yep. it was because of, you know, his, his psychology of hashish is all about the attainment of samadhi with ganja and practice. You know what I mean? It takes more than just ganja. It was that hmm. easy. We'd all be doing it. There's got to be some intention in that as well, you know? And, uh, um, you know, it's, I was going to talk a little bit about, uh, I recently wrote an article you can find online. It's uh, uh, the cannabis infused wine of Dionysius. Mm -hmm. yes. When I was going over that, one of the things I was really looking, you know, come across is I'd, I'd known about this connection between Dionysius and Shiva because of other books, but I never realized just how intense the connection between Dionysius and Shiva was, you know. This like is a historical fact, like in, in four or 500 BC, when Alexander went into India, he saw people there, worshipers of Shiva, pressing the grape and making wine. And he thought that he, you know, the legends were that, that Dionysius had come from this place, Nysa, which was one of the places they thought it was, was in India. And in Alexander's mind, when he came into India, he stumbled on to the birthplace of Nysa. And it's no lie that the 
devotees of Shiva and the devotees of Dionysius recognized this was the same deity, this deity of ecstatic celebration, this deity that, you know, ac accepted women power, man. Yep. You know, that was a big part of the Dionysian revolution, right? Uh, um, and uh, this is like not some fancy of, of new authors like in the 20th century, like Elaine Danilo. Agent authors wrote about this. Roman mm -hmm. historians of that time period wrote about this connection of Dionysius, you know, and, and there's connections between Dionysius and Yahweh as well, Adonis, mm -hmm. Dionysius. This is like there's coins minted with Yahweh and Dionysius becoming the same God, basically. Right? Mm. And it used to be quite an ecstatic religion at one time. This is much, much like Shiva religion, you know, in, in, in that sense of that, that ecstasy that, that was based around, you know. And uh, um, yeah, it's, it's really, 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 really powerful stuff, man. And uh, um, has Swami joined us yet? Is he on board here? That's Jan right off. I don't know. It looks like a couple of people maybe have not made the technological leap to uh, to get on here. I was, I was expecting a few other other speakers, but we can all talk. Has anybody got anything they want to say here? In the in the Kashmir Shavam tradition, um, the goal the goal is uh, samadhi. Like yoga is samadhi, right? And mm -hmm. so when we when we uh, think of the, the culmination of yoga as being samadhi and then samadhi stabilizing, we call it samavesa. We call it the absorption of Shiva. So we become Shiva himself always. Hmm. And But we can't get to that point unless we go first through Shakti. So it's like at the beginning, we're Anu. We're just an individual, not connected to the universal life force. And then we go through Shakti and she initiates us. She connects us to the life force. We have to let her in. She is like the grand teacher. And she and she runs us through tests. She she like gives us milk, and we go from being a little kid to then growing up, and then we integrate her. And then when when we once we integrate her, then we go into the shambo mode. Not shambo is like the, the full culmination of accepting everything in totality. See, when you go into the highest mode, you're just blissfully accepting everything because everything is shakti. Everything is just pulsating with her, and so there's nothing to do. Everything's already being done. Shambo just enjoys his shakti always making love to his shakti his shakti is making love back to him i'm just making love to her all the time and it's just blissful it's like pulsating wetness everywhere just the gnosis is persistent yeah. it's like all the time and that is that is what we seek for is that to, is to always be sucking on that amrit to always have that wine being poured into the skull the skull bowl to always be having and drinking the wine of the senses we show she is the senses she is the wine she is the bliss she's all of it and so when we let her into us and she allows us to become it, we realize Shakti is the very self-reflective awareness. We say in Kashmir Shivism that the mind is Shakti, the awareness is Shakti, but Shiva is the, the core of awareness. So when we go, I, that's Shiva. And we go, M, that's Shakti. I am as Shiva Shakti together. It's that constant self-awareness, but the totality of all being everywhere, everywhere is happening that same time that Shiva Shakti, Shiva Shakti, Shiva Shakti. Beautiful. We have an, Brothers, another uh, speaker. Here. I have to go. I, all my go love, and we see you. All my love, I need to leave, but blessings on this uh, wonderful occasion and prosperous occasion for all of us. Bless you all. Thank, thank you, Satyan. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, brother. Now we have another uh, presenter with us. Uh, we have Rachel. Uh, um, uh, I'll let her maybe introduce herself and tell us a bit about her and she's going to take us through a little bit of meditation and maybe while that's going on Swami will show up and uh, uh, we can tie it up with Swami. Thank you so much for joining us Rachel. We're so pleased to have some more Shakti energy. Uh, uh, it turned out to be a bit of a, uh, a, lingam, a lingam presentation, lingam energy here a little bit too much but uh, we're trying to balance things out here as best we can and we're really glad to have you here sister. Oh, you're muted. Unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yay, I'm so glad you're here. Hi, Selena. It's great to see you. And 
an honor to bring some uh, Shakti energy to the Shiva lunch here. Um, I've, been I've been listening the whole time, so uh, just just joined now on, figured out how to do that. So happy to be here with you all. And wow, what a wealth of information, what amazing stories everybody has shared. Uh, just so great to hear the enthusiasm and really this renaissance, the revival of celebrating uh, Maha Shivaratri. So I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I'm a, a regenerative cannabis farmer, and I also like to honor the plant medicine through ceremony. And so what I'd love to share with everybody tonight is a little bit of pranayama, breathing techniques that we can use to really embody everything that we've talked about of understanding Shiva and honoring Shiva tonight um, and also honoring our plant medicine, the, the cannabis plant medicine and um, really finding that divine balance with the Shiva and the Shakti energy through also uh, chanting. And they say, uh, even in the Bible, they say in the beginning was the word. And so some say that word was Om, which is really a vibration. And so I like to keep a foot personally in each world of uh, sort of being the bridge between the scientific world and the spiritual world. And so when you think about vibration, uh, if you look at it from one angle, it kind of is like a cosine graph, right? And so if you turn that towards you, it, it becomes something physical uh, in time and space. If you're familiar with organic chemistry, you might call this a confirmation, the way that molecules arrange themselves in time and space. And so the vibration of sound, when you look at it from a different perspective, it becomes matter. It becomes light, something we can see and obtain. And so OM was really all the vibration of the creation of the universe. So a lot of um, you were speaking tonight about the sense of creation, sustenance, and disillusion. And so when we sound OM, it comes from our own self and our body. So the O sound really emanates from our belly. And so if you think about your belly, your belly button, your navel, that was everybody's original life force, right? Our umbilical cord is where we all began uh, our sustenance, our creation. And so um, the OM, every inhalation and every exhalation should in theory begin and end with our navel center. So what I'd like to invite all of us to do in this moment is just practice feeling in to that space to our space of creation. And if you're familiar with the chakras or the uh, spinning wheel of energy, our navel center would be also called our solar plexus or manipura. And so that represents who you are, who yourself is. And so um, I forget his name is, you just had to leave, but he was saying, you know, what is it that you want on this planet? And what is it that you literally need to get rid of and remove so you can make the space but tonight is such an auspicious night to get so clear about that, that why, why are we on this planet? And it really comes from the breath, from the vayu, from the prana, that life force. So if you, um, I'm going to sit over here so everybody can see me. You can take your middle fingers and bring them right to your navel center and have them touch just sitting naturally. And as you find your inhalation, let it begin at the belly and breathe in deeply. Fill your whole belly, fill your pelvic bowl and breathe into your wholeness, into your fullness. As we previously practiced, breathe into the whole entire room. Let your body take up the space around you. Hold at the top of the inhalation. And then with your lips closed, again, the navel initiates the exhalation, the out breath. Slowly let the breath escape as you draw your belly button back behind your rib cage towards your spine, slowly letting the air come out through the nostrils. And once you feel like you can't breathe out any further, try to exhale a millimeter deeper. It's like you're doing a deep clean into all the crevasses of your body. Like we're uh, dusting the corners of our soul with our breath. So let's try that again. When you're ready, take a big inhalation through the nose. Slowly breathe into your wholeness, into your fullness. 
and exhale, completely releasing it out. And as you breathe out, you might start to feel your fingers cross and pass over one another. So really letting your hands feel this embodied space that you are creating. You can let your eyes close if that feels comfortable to you and start to tap into and feel your own rhythm through your very breath. Simply breathing in and peacefully breathing out. And now I'm going to offer a little prayer for us. If you have your ganja with you, um, I have a little chillin' pipe I'm going to be using tonight, and I've also uh, made some bong. I've been following along with everybody and I'll show you here the bong I made. I don't know if you could see has uh, rose petals and cardamom and fresh ganja. I use the flowers so it's nice and strong. <laughs> Definitely feeling it. <laughs> and when we breathe, when we work with the cannabis plant medicine, we're inviting in all of the elements here. So the earth being the plants itself, the element of fire, we're creating transformation and change. So when you bring the fire to the flower, we create that transformation and change that creates the smoke or the ethers. So we're sending our prayers up to the heavens, up to the gods and giving great thanks to Lord Shiva. So a mantra that I uh, invite to share with you all tonight is Om Namah Shivaya. And so we will, after we work with our herb, uh, we can practice our mantra uh, 108 times. So let's take a moment, if you're joining along with us, I'm using a little hemp wick to give a tribute to uh, smoking as clean as possible as we always can, eliminating the butane from the lighter. And I'm going to take a moment to say a prayer. Light the fire upon your flower. Breathe in deeply. And exhale it out to the gods. Om Shiva Shankara Hari Hari Ganja Boom Shiva. So now I invite everybody to join me for 108 rounds of Om Namah Shivaya. So if you're wondering why 108, there's many different reasons why this number is so auspicious. That one of which is the Sanskrit alphabet has 54 letters and each letter is seen as having a masculine and a feminine or a Shiva and a Shakti aspect. Um, and so if you do 54 times two, that equals 108. So giving homage to each of those uh, letters within the Sanskrit alphabet. Also, if you look at the number, the number one may represent God or the creation or the wholeness. Uh, the number zero is uh, the, the sustenance. And then the number eight looks like an infinity sign, that sense of infiniteness. And so together we have the creation, the sustenance and the disillusion. Um, there's many other aspects of 108 from the astrological perspective of the Vedas. When we look at uh, Ayurveda uh, in, the, in the sky and seeing the way that we have 10 uh, different houses and nine different plants, planets. Uh, sorry, 12 different houses times nine planets is 108. And so when we can chant, uh, you can even do a thousand and eight as well, but I thought we'd just offer 108 for today. And some other interesting things. So on a mala, if you see people wearing these beads uh, today, they often have a lot of aesthetic quality, but they really have a deep purpose. The japa mala is to... Uh, first of all, keep track of count um, when we count the uh, mantras. And a mantra, man means mind and tra is a cross. So we're going across mind. Our minds are always speaking to ourselves, or having this sense of chitta, what we call in Sanskrit is a chatter, sort of that self-talk that we hear. And quite often the self-talk can be very, um, 
negative towards ourselves. They say uh, how we speak to ourselves is worse than we might speak to anybody else. So in this moment, I am inviting everybody to just release that and see if you can use that mantra to bring in a sense of loving kindness and the way that your mind can speak to yourself from here on out. Um, and so when we go across our mala beads, the Japa Mala, we'll use, uh, and if you have the beads, you're welcome to go along. If you don't have them, that's absolutely fine. You can join in the chant at any time. And we'll use our thumb and our middle finger to press on each bead. This center bead here is called the Guru bead. And, and this bead, we give great thanks and can bring to our third eye, our Ajna chakra, to give homage to our Guru, to Lord Shiva tonight. And uh, Guru is the one who removes the darkness so that we may see the light. So in doing this chant, it's really a discipline, right? It takes discipline to say something 108 times. It takes a commitment to something. And when you think about commitment, think about two molecules bonding together. So we just inhaled the ganja and now we're committing to her, to working with her as our plant ally. And we're committing to Lord Shiva, to the Lord of the ganja, the Lord of the bomb. We're giving great thanks to the plants, to the universe for our very existence. So give your whole self over. This is a service that we're giving. And the more we put into it, the more you'll get out of it. It's just the law of attraction, whatever energy that you're creating, whatever it is that you're voicing. And I know for myself, I just wanna mention the first time I ever tried chanting. I'm not a singer, I was very quiet. You'll probably hear tonight, but think about it as your heart's song. It doesn't matter what you sound like. It's not about being in a right tune, uh, but it's more just about letting your voice be heard. Letting the gods, all of the divine, your ancestors know that you are here. The, the lower, the more from our heart, the bhakti is from that heart center. The more we can sing there, the, the more our prayers will be heard and answered. So uh, we'll begin together. Let's take a deep breath in through the nose and out through the no mouth, just clearing the channel. Inhale. And exhale. We'll be chanting Om Namah Shivaya. So we'll begin on our first exhalation. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya, 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 Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. Keep going with your heart. Om Namah Shivaya, 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 Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya, 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 Om Namah Shivaya. Let your prayers be heard. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya, 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 Stay committed, Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, 
Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. Give your whole self over to it. Om Namah Shivaya, 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 Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya, 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 Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya, 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 Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya, 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 stay present, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. Boom Shiva Mahadev. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was beautiful and helps us get centered for our last presenter, the great holy man Swami Chaitanya. I don't know if I pronounced your last the last part right, Swami. You'll have to uh, correct me on that, uh, the pronunciation of that term. You're muted. It's on the bottom left. Bottom left. There we go. I'm not alone in uh, mispronouncing uh, the name. That's why I just usually just go by Swami. There you uh, go. Tanya, chai like tea, chai, and Tanya like uh, a ballerina or an uh, ice skater, figure skater. Chai Tanya, right? Okay. And uh, it, uh, it it means uh, consciousness. And uh, Rachel was talking about cheat. And Chit as uh, Satchitananda uh, works into Chaitanya. So uh, they are sort of one and the same at a certain level. So, well, thank you uh, for inviting me on to Shivaratri. It is quite an honor to uh, be a guest here. And uh, yeah, then the Om Namah Shivaya chant, of course, is uh, one that we always chant. There's other ones too, Hara Hara Mahadev, Hara Hara Mahadev, Kashi Vishwanathi Gange. Uh, one of my favorite ones for uh, doing a chillum or smoking ganja is uh, you take the joy and you say, Alak ko dea palak deko dunya kajalak, and behold the wonders of the world revealed through the cannabis. And so it's a way of seeing the world as a magical illusion uh, and taking it to the, to the higher level that way. So um, anyway, it's... Uh, what to say about Shivaratri, the idea that this energy is now uh, walking the earth and being amongst us, uh, that is, you know, celebrated. Uh, Shiva's different uh, incarnations or manifestations of Shiva, where um, Shiva will just show up to you at a certain place. Sometimes you'll look up and you'll see that little sickle moon up in the sky, that little sickle moon. You say, oh, that's a sign from Shiva right? Or something else will, will grab your attention and you realize that, oh, that's, that's a message from Shiva. Maybe you see a, a beggar on the street or something like that. And there's like, all of a sudden, there's a little zap in between. You say, oh, oh, that, that was like, that was a little Shakti from, from Shiva. And that's the way that Shiva operates in the world in his form as being in the present. <clears throat> 
Now he has a form of Shiva as the Agora Shiva who is on the burning ghats and infecting and being involved in that sort of transformation where you cross over to the other side as the Lord of destruction there, but the liberation of the soul through that, right? Then he has this manifestation as a lingam and normally on Shivaratri, we're pouring over our honey and milk and melted butter and ghee and all these things over the Shivaling uh, that is then uh, our worship ceremony where you know we can go on for hours and hours pouring these libations over. Uh, and then uh, there's the form of Shiva that is beyond the expansion of the universe that just the very conception of it doesn't even put borders on, on, the, on the universe and all its multi-universes uh, through the time of creation and dissolution uh, and the maintaining. Uh, so that's Shiva. And then Shiva does have a, a, a wrathful form uh, that you know, is breathing fire and so on. Uh, that's sometimes called Rudra. And then of course, uh, Nikki just reminded me, uh, my favorite form of Shiva is you know, Shiv Nataraj, where he's dancing. Uh, and in the dancing, uh, he is then uh, creating the universe through the uh, uh, Exo Art Tandava, which is a th 108 dances uh, that Shiva positions that he does in order to uh, create the universe. And that, you know, we celebrate that same with 108 repetitions of, of the, uh, uh, Panchadasa, uh, the five-syllable mantra uh, of Shiva. And so Shiva is the, uh, the center. And then um, when we think about the chakras, right, in the Muladhara chakra at the base of the spine, in that little triangle, uh, there is a Shiva lingam there. And that is then, you know, how we focus the energy in the lower chakras and bring them up and transform them. Uh, there's another lingam in the heart chakra and uh, another lingam in the third eye chakra. And that's how the energy is su supreme. And the, the third eye chakra is like that jyotir lingam, the lingam of light uh, that, is, that is absorbing all the energy of the universe and radiating it back out to be shared uh, with anyone who uh, it tunes into that. And even actually those who don't tune into it share in the energy. So. Uh, that's the, all the forms of Shiva as a beggar and as a yogi. Uh, and then one of the great forms of Shiva is with uh, Shiva Parvati. Uh, as the, uh, and just as I say Shiva Parvati, who comes in, uh, <laughs> but my Parvati, <laughs> Nikhija and Nirmala is her, is her Sanskrit name. Uh, and uh, she is my consort and uh, beloved. <laughs> and Shiva Parvati. And uh, there's a certain place where Shiva Parvati joined in the space above the third eye, uh, the Shiva Shakti, the Kundalini rising and joins there. So you go beyond the, uh, the duality of male and female in that, uh, this is called the Kamakala Chakra. And in another triangle, uh, there is uh, the Shiva and Parvati there united in the bliss uh, beyond any time or space. And so uh, we, we use this, the lingam as a way to symbolize the essence of the energy without a physical form. The lingam is actually a, a, a representation of a non-physical thing with a physical thing. And the lingam is the simplest physical thing as a source of energy. And then we must always remember that the lingam is embedded in a yoni, right? And a lingam is embedded in a yoni and that is part of the Shiva Shakti. Uh, and that Shiva without Shakti, yes, there you are, thank you, Chris. Shiva without Shakti has no power. And so, um, it just, okay, I, it occurred to me that we did Om Namah Shivaya, but there's a variation that my teacher in India, Chinanandagiri, gave me of the Shiva mantra, and it includes the, the feminine, the Shakti. And I think one of the great things about this day and age is that so much of the religion has been masculine dominated to worship the goddess and to worship the goddess equal with, with the god uh, is one of those things that our modern day wants to, wants to uh, bring forward. So there's a form of, uh, this was given to me by Chinanandagiri, Om Hrim Namah Shivaya. So we put the syllable Hrim after Om, and Hrim is the, there's the syllable, uh, the Bija mantra of all the goddesses taken together, but particularly it's the Bija mantra of Bhubaneswari, the goddess of the earth, and also 
Purasundari, the goddess who is the, the, the all embodiment of all the threeness of the universe. So when we say Hrim, Hrim is like Om for the manifested world, the manifested universe. Om includes all the unmanifest and the manifest. And Hrim is where we bring it down through the creativity of the feminine. So uh, we'll just do a few uh, uh, of these Om Hrim Namah Shivaya since we, we start, I came on when you were doing Om Namah Shivaya. So uh, we, we then incorporate the, the divine feminine into this. And so we'll just do that for just a, a few minutes. And we'll go, so Om, Om Hrim Namah Shivaya, 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 Om Hrim Namah Shivaya. So you can carry that on as the 108. And there's a way also to do uh, the mantra japa, as it's called. There's, there's three forms of japa. The one is the out loud, the vaikati form of japa, and that is great to do in a group. And then there's the whispered form of the japa, which is madhya uh, form of japa. And then there's a silent form of japa. And the silent form of japa is one that you can carry on continuously. That you, it's sort of this uh, bass, uh, like a, a tamburi bass note underneath whatever else you're doing. And so it just becomes, oh. and you speed up the rhythm. So it's like, oh. so you're creating this rhythm and this, and this kind of torque within yourself with the mantra. And what happens is, as through the mantra, your bones start to vibrate with that tone. And eventually all the molecules in your body vibrate with that tone. And that tone, that sound, is the divine you are invoking. The mantra is the divine. The yantra is the place for it to manifest. And that's tantra. So uh, anyway. Can I just say a couple of things <laughs> I'd like to add? Which is, um, and I know this from personal experience because and it, it does work. If you say Om Namah Shivaya with full pure intention a hundred thousand times, expect big changes in your life. It absolutely, it's because Shiva is the God of transformation. So when you recite that mantra a hundred thousand times, and it doesn't have to be all on the same day, you know, it's just when you've done it a hundred thousand times with pure intention, you will have transformation. And the other thing I wanted to say is that right now, as some of you probably know, the um, Kumbha Mela is happening in Haridwar in uh, Uttarakhand state of India up on the Ganga. And tonight there'll be, well, it probably was 12 hours ago, but there's huge celebrations happening. There's the big, um, the Jalus, the parade, when all of the Babas go out and parade to the river, that probably happened this morning. And tonight will be a very special time in India as literally, millions and millions of people will be celebrating this. this Arty, this yeah, fire I mean, ceremony. I mean, all over the country, I mean, they'll be drinking bong and they'll be very high. So um, coming from that direction on our globe tonight is some lots of higher consciousness. Yeah, and whenever we chant Om and do those mantras, our psyche, our mind, mental patterns join those of all those people doing that, not only in India, but all around the world. And that's the great thing about chanting Om just by itself is when you chant Om, you join the chorus of the syllable Bija mantra of the universe, which has been chanted since time immemorial, will chant in time into the future. And we become part of that wave every time you use the, the mantra of Om. So uh, it's just a blessing to be here and thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Swami, and, and, you, and your partner as well. It, it was beautiful. Uh, you know, this has been a wonderful event. I've been doing these like small little home Shivaratris the last couple of years and because of COVID, you know, we, which seemed like a terrible thing, you know, and it is a terrible thing, but there's also this massive change happening in humanity right now because of it. And here we are all alone together, you know, and we wouldn't have been doing this if it hadn't been for COVID, you know, here we are all celebrating this. And this is going to, this is going to grow in the West. Shivaratri is going to become a celebration of Ganja people. I feel that. And this is yeah, just, yeah, yeah. and I thank you all so much for taking part of this.
I want to say one more thing about Shivratri. There's a, like Nikki mentioned the Kumbh Mela, and that's when millions and millions of people go try and be and be in the same place on the edges of the of the Ganges, right, the Ganga. But Shivratri is completely different. Everyone goes to their local Shiva temple. And so what we're doing here is your local little Shiva temple. And that's what it is. All around every Shiva temple uh, tonight and la over the night, every single one of them has a celebration. It's not like everybody goes one place. It's every good one goes to their place. And that's why it has that extra energy that it's your neighbors and your friends and people who've been worshiping at that temple for such a long time. And there's a whole myth about how Shiva's, uh, you know, all these millions of temples happened all over as part of the, uh, the, the Hindu mythology. So, yeah, we're doing the thing in the right oh, way. Yeah. <laughs> I like to think that in the Kali Yuga that, you know, the, the Iron Age, the age of, you know, materiality and physicalness that an aspect of spirituality has taken on the physical form of ganja and a medicine yes. that we take body born of Shiva from Shiva's own yes. body. And uh, I think that's a really powerful way to take the medicine, you know, with all of its intent, the difference between a sadhu in India who sits down with his chill and before he sits down to do his asanic, sonic practices and some kid that's, you know, about to smoke a blunt and, play uh, um, some video game is an intention. And it's all in how you see this herb and how you visualize it and what you put into that and take back in with it, you know? And I think on this, the final third chillum, you know, of, of the three chillum ritual of today's Shiva Ratri uh, 2021, I just wanna thank you all as aspects of Shiva that have come here today to share your wisdom and if you have any closing words, you know, we'll just open up the floor and uh, go from there. Thank you so much, man. Thanks for coming. It means so much. Thank you. Um, I want to share something really quick, um, if that's okay. But um, uh, I love, um, actually, what, what's his partner's Swami name? Swami and Nikki. Nikki? Yeah. Um, thanks for um, adding, uh, thanks for adding that in about how powerful the mantras are. Um, I actually had a really powerful experience a couple years back with mantra beads and um, I had no idea um, what that would open up. I was actually had such a deep experience that my whole yoga mat was completely drenched in tears. Like I'm talking like a puddle that of just like an explosion of tears that came running out of my eyes. And it really blasted me open. And it actually like was really scary looking back at it. it was it really shook me up. And I didn't know if I was having a mental breakdown or what what was gonna be happening. And it was it was very intense. So um you're right, like they are very powerful. And I think it's very important that we have tools to work with because the times are really intense. And um the times are really intense and we need tools right now. And uh, just like Rachel was talking about with the chitter chatter and Rachel, thank you so much for um, sharing with us. It was really beautiful to hear um, you and guide us through that. So thank you so much, Rachel, for coming. And um, yeah, uh, what you talked about with the OM. Yeah, that's um, something as well too, I think, um, and the breathing. Um, these are really important things that we have that are free, <laughs> that we can use and access at any time. And um, we just need to create the space for it. And as the feminine, I think, you know, um, setting up that space and that time and the right setting and um, using these plants, these medicines um, with uh, a way of, you know, for self, self awareness. And the more that we become more self aware, we can become uh, things around us become better. You know, it's like walking in our truth and walking in our. Um, leading of, especially I think for the feminine, the beauty that comes out, that's kind of been lost in our world. It's been very masculinized and um, remembering that beauty, I think is gonna be another important aspect to us um, going forward because I think our society's forgotten the beauty. So, and when I say beauty, I'm talking like it's everywhere. It's just, we've forgotten to look for it. So those are my words. Thank you everybody. Special thanks to Mark Richardson too, you know, for hosting the event here on a Zoom platform and YouTube and stuff like that and uh, taking care of the, 
the control board and stuff like that. Thanks so much, Bubble Man. Boom, boom. Yeah, man. Boom. Shankara, Shankara Mahadev. Thank it you. was a wonderful, beautiful experience. Um, I listened to the entire thing and, and had full enjoyment. I think it's great. All the P I had no doubt that you would invite high caliber folks. And so thank you all. I know that the uh, more than 200 people that have been watching have been uh, enjoying it. Can I say one th more thing if we have time? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we talked about mantras, right? So I want to talk about the secret mantra of Kashmir Shaivism. And we, you know, you were talking about all the different forms of Shiva. Well, there is a tricky form of Shiva, which there's a school of, of Shaivism that we call Trika, and that appeals to the tricky part of us, right? So if, you're think, if you think you're clever, if you think you're cunning, if you think you're a tricky person, well, you're going to understand what I'm going to say. And what we're saying is that every time you breathe, you're reciting the mantra. Every time you take a breath, you're reciting the mantra. So if you become aware of this and you realize that you're, you're reciting the mantra 48,000 times a day. So if you become aware that you're always reciting the mantra, you're doing japa all the time. You're doing it all the time. And that's the trick. Swamiji used to say, you know, oh, or was that, was that so my, get the my trick, master kush? Oh, bubble man doesn't know he's being on there. <laughs> Sorry guys. <laughs> So if you're if you're a trickster and that that appeals to your mind and you think you can crack the trick and you can always remember this trick, then you're doing japa all the time. It's all in the well, intention, man. That, that japa is so ham hamsa. That's the, that's the syllable of it. So ham hamsa, and as you <laughs> breathe in, that's what it sounds like if right. you listen to it. And and the, the other thing is hamsa is a, is a, a Sanskrit word meaning the swan. Right, and the swan has all sorts of uh, beautiful connotations symbolically. You know, we know as the ugly ducking becomes the swan, but the swan is also uh, the swan is supposed to be able to take milk that's dissolved into water and just drink the milk from it. So it's 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 quality of discernment of being able to detect the truth in the midst of uh, of the falseness. Right, and so that, that that's hamsa. And if you, as you say, if you breathe that mantra silently all day long, but are you conscious of it? Are you aware of living it that way? Uh, then you ride on that wave. I would connect that mystery to the mystery of Jesus walking on water. See that the, the swan also goes into the water, but he's never, like he comes out of the water and he's fine. He's like, I'm not wet, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I was in the water, but I'm out of it now. I'm, the, the world doesn't even touch me. I walk on it like no problem. Like that's what I do. Yeah, yeah. And and actually, speaking of Jesus, that reminds me when you know when you just said, Chris, that thing about how Shiva is in this bud, and we're gonna you know every time you imbibe him. I having grown up Catholic, I immediately thought, oh my God, that's just like the host in church, right? You know, given the body of Christ, right? And I'd never quite put that together. So thank you for that. That's a really interesting way to look at it. Bingo. Like that. <laughs> Yeah. And a boss for the win. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. It's been so, so great, man. Happy Shivaratri. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Shivaya. Shubh Shivaratri. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. You're all Shiva to me. Thank you very much.